Local broadcasts of Kako are made possible by the support of viewers like you. Mahalo and bye. Young Brothers, providing quality service you can count on. Connecting our island communities for over 120 years as the state's leading inter-island freight transportation company. The city of Honolulu is set to open its rail project after years of controversy over spending and delays. On June 30th, the first trains will roll out, starting in Kapolei and ending at Aloha Stadium, years after its target start date and miles short of its intended stop. Many questions about the rail remain, but perhaps the biggest is this. Will residents ride it? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of Kako, Hawaii's Town Hall, start now. Aloha and welcome to Kako, Hawaii's Town Hall, live from the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Multimedia Studio. I'm Yanji Denise. Tomorrow marks a day that has been billions of dollars and more than a decade in the making. The first segment of the Honolulu Rail Project, which the city and county of Honolulu have now dubbed Skyline, will open to the public. Back in 2012, the city signed an agreement with the Federal Transit Administration promising a 20-mile system from East Kapolei to Ala Moana Center at a cost of $5.1 billion, fully open by 2020. The project is now funded to be built a mile shorter to Halikawila and South Street, cost roughly twice as much with an estimated price tag of at least $10 billion and not fully open until 2031. When riders board tomorrow, the driverless trains will take them across nine stations from East Kapolei to Aloha Stadium in Halava. The next segment is slated to open in 2025 and run to Middle Street and will include the Honolulu Airport. The final segment, set to open in 2031, will run to the edge of Kaka'ako. Hard officials say they hope to fund the fund the last two stations to Ala Moana and have even discussed eventually going as far as UH Manoa. Kako means all of us, as in we are all in this together. And whether you plan to ride the rail or not, if you've paid general excise tax on Oahu in the last decade, you have helped to fund this project. So we want to hear from you in our discussion tonight. You can email or call in your questions. We're also streaming live at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook and YouTube pages. In our town hall tonight, we have a member of the HART Board, an executive with the city's Department of Transportation, which is tasked with operating operating the trains, and a member of the Honolulu City Council. We also have community leaders from neighborhoods along the rail route and a journalist who has been reporting on this project for years. We invited HART CEO Lori Kahikina, Mayor Rick Blangiardi, and DTS Director Roger Morton to our town hall, but they all turned us down, citing a scheduling conflict. They are attending ceremonial events tonight ahead of tomorrow's opening. So let's begin. And Marcel Honoré, I want to start with you. You're a reporter at Civil Beat. You've been reporting on this project basically since the groundbreaking about 10 years ago. Um, when people look at Skyline, I think one of the things that strikes us really is the cost. Five to 10 billion certainly is quite an increase. Where do you see, you know, why did those costs go up so high? Oh man, there's, there's you know, a, a laundry list of issues that have frankly kind of evolved um, in the past decade or so, you know, um, back in the, the Dan Grabowskis era, um, around when construction started, uh, they started to see issues with um, just general cost of construction in the market, um, and Honolulu was, was right up there. So, they, so Hart would certainly point to the fact that they got caught right in the middle of just one of the, the steepest markets in a long time, and you know, of, of the cities in the United States, Honolulu was right up there. They would also point to the lawsuits that helped to delay that construction and frankly kind of landed them in there. But it was a lot more complicated than that. You know, there have been plenty of audits that have pointed to the mismanagement and just the difficulties when you talk about trying to build a, a modern rail metro system from scratch on an island and in a state that frankly has never had anything like that. So, you know, this was back in the 2014, 2015 era. Um, I would say 2020 was a significant year where a lot of things imploded. Uh, the, the, the folks that had replaced uh, Dan Grabowskis um, under, under Andy Robbins, they were trying the, the so-called P3, the public-private partnership, and that, uh, that did not go very well in the end, and it was hard to monitor that because it all had to stay very secret. But in that era, what I think what, what uh, the city and Hart really ran up against was Dillingham and the Dillingham Corridor. And that presented a whole new uh, 
slate of problems. Not really new, actually, because we've known for decades that that would be just a gauntlet and really one of the, the biggest challenges of constructing a rail line. But Hart and the city, frankly, were, were not as fast, very slow to act. And that just had a cascading effect that impacted cost and risk. And when you talk about the bids to, to build it, it just had a domino effect that created all sorts of new um, problems in the hundreds and even billions of dollars. So it's, it's a whole saga, but you know, in a few minutes, I would say that that's really <laughs> driven it up. Well, you summed it up really nicely. And when you look at that history and the reporting that you've done, do you think that we will reach the budget that we have now and the timeline that we have now? I, I it's, you know, we're really going to have to see. I mean, Hart now has a plan in place. They've done new designs. They've got the Malka shift, uh, which we could describe in some detail, but it's basically their solution to really uh, get through some of the utility relocation woes that are plaguing uh, Dillingham. The Malka shift still has some, uh, some approvals that need to be done, and those you know, those utility re relocations are underway, but they are, they are really at the beginning. We have three years of this, and then you still have to build in a town. So I, it, it's, it, we're really just gonna have to see. There's so many more challenges ahead. Okay, well, let's focus on the route that we do have. Uh, and we invited neighborhood board leaders from different neighborhood boards along the rail line to talk about what they're most looking forward to when rail opens tomorrow and some of the trepidation that they still might have. We want to start with Keone Dudley, who is a member of the neighborhood board out in Kapolei. Uh, the first station is in East Kapolei. So, Mr. Dudley, let's start with you. What are you most excited about when rail opens tomorrow? And what are some concerns you still have? I think what I'm most excited about is that <clears throat> we desperately need rail as much as I oppose rail, uh, and uh, the uh, need is for ridership. Uh, <clears throat> we have 76,000 more houses going to be built on our, uh, in central Oahu and the west side. That means since uh, it traditionally one person out of the, each house works in a city, uh, that means 76,000 more people going into the city. We only can make one more lane on the freeway. We, uh, once we pack the freeway and we pack the um, uh, trains with 800 people uh, on a train, we still uh, have 30,000 people who cannot make it to work in the morning from the central and west side. So having the rail, getting the rail completed is terribly important to our people. And it's uh, terribly important to the future of Hawaii. And I uh, greatly hope that people will ride the rail much as I oppose the rail. <laughs> okay, and I wanna get explore that a little bit later, but let's move now to Mitchell Tananis, who chairs the EVA Neighborhood Board. For, for presum presumably, uh, the people that you represent will be boarding at that East Kavale <coughs> station as well. Uh, what are you most looking forward to when Skyline starts up tomorrow? And what are some of your continued reservations? Well, I would say, because East Kapolei, just to correct yourself, where the first rail line starts is Ho'opili. That's 96706. So that's in the Eva Beach district. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Eva Beach, uh, Ho'opili, it'll benefit, I would say, right now, the Ho'opili district because they can walk to the station, parking is closer to there. For going into Fort Weaver Road, where Eva Beach is itself, it's, it will be a little bit more difficult for our community on the inside, saying that you're only gonna end up in Aloha Stadium right now. Now, if it's stretched all the way to where it's supposed to be, I could, I could say our community can't wait. Yeah. Um, for our community members that's in Eva Beach, you know, there's an express bus that will take them wherever they have to go in town. So they'll use our, you know, the number one bus service that we have in, in, the, in the nation to get there. It, it's hard for them to go off the track to either Kapule or to Waipaho to get onto a rail, to stop at Aloha Stadium, to get off, transfer. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense as of right now. But I, I, I'm thinking that our community is waiting for the rail to complete. I don't think, I, I can't wait for my kids to use them. I can't wait for myself. I'm gonna use it tomorrow, uh, hopefully, and beyond and see for myself what we've been waiting for. 
Okay, let's move now from Eva to Waipahu where Richard Oshiro is on the neighborhood board there. Richard, same question. What are you most looking forward to and what are your continued concerns? Well, I think that the promise that rail brought when we started considering it a while back, actually much earlier than what Mr. Uh, Monterey said, uh, we started actually 31 years ago, and I was on the board at the time. Uh, the rail project at the time failed because the city council was not able to pass the increase in the general excise tax. So that was in 1992. So it's been that from that point we've waited for rail. But at that time, the reason everybody supported rail, a lot of people did, was because we already had congestion on the roads and the freeways in getting into town. And a lot of uh, people on the west side, like Waipahu, Eva, you know, that, that go into downtown Honolulu, if they catch the bus, it'll take maybe three hours a day. You have to go in and get back uh, because you have to wait for the bus, transfer, and then get to where you're going. And many people do work in town and on into Ala Moana and Waikiki. So if people could save at least an hour of time traveling, then it will be an hour more to uh, spend with their families. So it was really something that could improve the quality of life for people, especially on the west side who had to commute on the bus because they had no other alternative. Uh, it could save them time in terms of you know, traveling. The other part of it is the um, development. We talk a lot about uh, development along the rail line, but hopefully at this point, you know, uh, we have to be, be very cautious in terms of how we develop along the rail line. So we have to pay a lot of attention of what's being proposed. We've seen that start already in Waipau, but as we move further uh, along the, the rail line, we'll see a lot more proposals for additional development. Okay, and let's move along the rail line and go now to Pearl City where Larry Vare is a board member there. Uh, Larry, what are your concerns and what are you look most looking forward to tomorrow? Well, I have my concerns, but we have a lot of residents in the area that have much bigger concerns. And especially with our, our partner townships with Milani, everybody was looking forward to that parking garage that was supposed to be built there. 1,600 spaces, but, uh, and of course, the uh, Lori Keele County, you know, we, uh, you know we, we had talked about this in email, uh, and she had to make the decision, you know, because she's looking for funding. And of course, the easiest way to do it was to take that 350 million from that parking garage. And of course, uh, the chair of the Milani board and myself, we fought it. And, uh, and of course, the decision was made to go ahead and take that funding. But I, I've been giving this a lot of thought. And I thought about Milani uh, uh, residents, and of course, taking care of Pearl City. But we're in that triangle. And like Keone said, there's a lot of traffic that's going through there. How do you get your people out of the cars? I would hate to see Milani residents driving to Pearl City Highland Station, get to the parking lot where there's only 1,600 spaces, and they're circling and circling and there's no spots. It's not enough. So I thought really the most efficient way to do this and, and cost effective would to be to put together a special shuttle bus designated from Waiwa, Pearl City, give them a designated lane, get them into that train station, drop them off. Because the key thing with most people, if you can cut the time down that they waste in their cars, that's gonna be the big thing. But as a Pearl City neighborhood board, also with my residents, I've talked to them, I said, there was a lot of negativism at first, but now that it's built, and people are getting a chance to write it, they're starting to think. Uh, I tried to help out with heart for their first success story. And what is that success story? What could it be? Well, no kidding, the first success story, if you could get the shipyard workers that come from West Oahu out of their vehicles, get on a Kapolei, get on that train, get off at Halava Station, and there's a bus already in a special lane, get through Contra Flow, through Makalapa Gate, right to their destinations. If you could cut that in half, that's the first success story for Hart. And the other thing is for ridership. You know, my vision was, uh, you know, years back when this all started, was we needed to get that ridership up because all of us, you know, we gotta pay for the operating cost. What we're gonna get right now, we're still gonna have to take it out of taxes to do that. But how can you get the operating cost up? You can't run the rail and cut it off at seven o'clock in the evening. You need to bring that up, but you gotta have a requirement. What could that requirement be, the big ticket item to get people to ride from Waikiki in the evening? If we put a casino out in West Oahu, <laughs> imagine this, ridership goes down seven o'clock as you're going west, but all of a sudden at that seven o'clock, now all the tourists 
are headed to casino. Well, and I think today. casinos might be another caco, but that is an interesting thought. I want to move now from Pearl City to IA, where Stephen Wood is on the neighborhood board. Stephen, same question. You're, what you're excited about when it opens tomorrow and what you're still concerned about. Yeah, I, th I think I'm excited just like everybody else is excited that over the years we've been waiting for this and now it's a reality that we can actually you know, participate in uh, the ridership of this uh, this uh, extensive project that we've had here on the island. Um, I, I know my residents in my community are really excited about it as well. Uh, I personally see myself actually utilizing the rail. Uh, I own a condo in Waipa'u that I would be traveling from Maia to Waipa'u to use it. Um, and so, uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, the things, the challenges that I still see um, and things that I've been receiving from uh, my constituents is uh, right now traffic patterns associated with the build out of the rail are still not ideal. Uh, we're seeing lengths of uh, along that rail line of where uh, businesses are being impacted still uh, because of traffic patterns associated with it. For example, in Larry's district uh, near Waimana Home Road, there's about a, it's, it takes about two miles to actually get to a business if you're going from one direction and trying to get to the other side. Uh, because there is no U-turns. You have to actually go from one light to another light to actually do that U-turn. And we're seeing that uh, in several areas along the rail. Um, another, another issue is, is for us right now, the stadium is being torn down. And we're excited about Halava Station being where it's at uh, because you know, the stadium district is being planned right now to be a big, uh, big impact on our economy in IAEA. Um, but uh, really where the ridership's going to be is to the airport and also to uh, Makalapa Station uh, to support the Pearl Harbor folks. And that's not opening up for another year and a half. And so uh, one of the things I've been asking Hart to do in my meetings is to try and get that open sooner uh, because I think that would definitely increase the ridership um, going forward. Uh, last thing I do want to mention is uh, uh, facilities at the rail stations. Uh, I have been asked numerous times about bathrooms in particular. Um, there are bathrooms there. Uh, how we manage that and how we utilize those, I think going forward is another discussion that we can have later on tonight. But uh, I think it is a possibility. Um, but it has been a significant uh, topic for, uh, that I've received over the last couple weeks, um, surprisingly. I want to bring in Patrick Preusser, uh, who is here for the Department of Transportation from the city, the director of the Department of Transportation. DTS, of course, is responsible for operating uh, Skyline. And just to give our viewers some perspective, we want to go over a few nuts and bolts here. We have a graphic here. Skyline runs the hours of operation five in the morning till seven on weekdays, eight to seven on weekends and holidays. The fair fares mirror that of the bus, $3 for adults, $1.50 for youth. A uh, dollar twenty-five for seniors, and on that ridership question, and I know we're going to get into this tonight. Uh, the city does expect eight to ten thousand riders per day by the end of this year. Twenty-five thousand riders per day for the next segment, Aloha Stadium to Middle Street, and uh, roughly eighty-five thousand riders per day once that final segment to Kakaako is complete. Just interested to hear your thoughts about those ridership numbers, where they come from, and how significant you think they are. Yeah, I mean, there's there's been a lot of analysis gone into rider, you know, building ridership models and forecasting the need. Um, you know, the ridership models can only take you so far, and you know, only time will tell. You know, what we actually achieve, and I think there's some good momentum. Uh, I think this is an important part of the transportation system for Honolulu and and Oahu, and um, I'm excited to see what the numbers look like after we open the first segment. There's already a question here, uh, and I, I'd love to bring in our audience, and remember you can call or email your questions, send them, send them to us on social media as well. This person asks, in closing time at 7 p.m. seems kind of early, is there a chance it might get extended to a later time? So, uh, and this is not uncommon, when you start up a new system, we are going to monitor the ridership numbers, and yes, there are always opportunities to make adjustments based on demand. Uh, uh, I know earlier, you know, there was a mention about operating costs and sustainability. So we want to be very responsible about uh, about that. And if there is a demand for hours to to expand, we'll look at that. We'll seek the the required approvals, and we'll make any uh, you know adjustments. 
On the subject of operating costs, I want to go now to Honolulu City Council member Tyler DeSantos Tam. Um, the city is estimating that it will cost about $75 million a year to operate HART. That is above and beyond the construction costs themselves, or Skyline, I should say. I still have to get that name into my head. But given that $75 million annual expense, we know that fares will not make that up. And, and that's not the case with the bus either, right? That they run a deficit when it comes to fares, and it is a very well used system. But um, given those ridership numbers that we laid out, do, do those two match? In other words, if we have $75 million in expenses, 10,000 people a year riding this, how, how does that measure up in your mind? You know, I think that for the first few years, we're gonna face this dilemma of, you know, tracking ridership and tracking costs and kind of the ROI. Once we get to Middle Street, once we get into town, I think that equation is gonna change. I think there's a few other things that we need to keep in mind. Um, the cost to operate per passenger for the bus is a, is a whole lot more expensive than for rail. So rail is a much more efficient way of getting people around um, the urban core along the sort of south shore of, of the island. And then beyond that, there is a fundamental question, how do we pay for it? It is a new cost for all of us. And so I think for me and my colleagues for future years um, beyond this current fiscal year, we're gonna have to think creatively about how we can fund this. I've talked um, you know, for the past on the campaign trail and now about some creative ideas, a TIF structure, that's a tax increment financing district for these new developments that we're expecting around the rail stations. How can we take the new property tax that they're gonna generate and help pay for rail? So it's not people, you know, it's not just everyone around the island paying, but we put a premium on being, uh, having the proximity to the rail line. That was kind of the idea, and we need to create that structure. It doesn't exist right now, but a lot of other cities are doing it, so let's bring that idea here. Okay, I want to bring in Reverend Moses Barrios, who's the president of Faith Action Hawaii. You know, we talk a lot about numbers and how long this is going to be, but let's talk about the people who are actually going to start utilizing rail and what kind of an impact do you think this can have uh, in the people that you work with most closely in terms of their daily lives and their commute? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I do think that it, being part of a faith-based organization like Faith Action Hawaii, uh, th there is certainly this world perspective that we carry that is that really derives from a posture of spirituality of of faith of hope of reconciliation of of morality of ethics and faith action has been one of the very first supporters of this rail project and it's because we believe that the destination the end goal shall we say is really um, the improvement of the quality of life for the people of this island and to have safe streets to walk in, to have housing that's affordable, to have communities that are healthy, especially for the working class. And when we begin to look at this, we, we see it as much more than a transportation tool. Uh, I think it, we see it as something that uh, will really help uh, and make it better, our, our kind of common human life together. There, there seems to be a connection there, and I think that's what people really care about is the quality of life. I want to bring in Anthony Alto, who is a Heart Board member since 2021. Um, when we talk about ridership, I know that you don't think that that is the best metric. When we val evaluate rail and that $75 million annual investment on top of the money spent so far and the money that we will spend to build it out, uh, what do you think is the better course to look at? What, what are the better metrics? So I should explain that I became a supporter of the rail project after I spent a lot of my free time for several years fighting against the Ho'opili and Courage um, housing developments. Um, and I did it on behalf of the Sierra Club. We took those developments to the Supreme Court three times. Keone Dudley actually was our leader. I was an, a backup to Keone. But um, we, uh, we spent so much time working on it. And at the end, it was clear that we could not win that battle. And we had to sit down and we thought about it and we said, we cannot win these battles to protect this farmland. And I should say, by the way, that protecting that farmland and the rest of our farm farmland is vital. I think people understand now much more than they did before just how vulnerable our food supply is, which is the issue that we were talking about. Um, Coa Ridge and Ho'opili were the two most productive farms in the state of food that was grown and consumed in this state. So there was a very important reason to protect those farmlands. Um, but um, what we were looking at 
we realize what, that we were, we're not going to be able to stop these developments because we have such a housing crisis in this state. And so we stopped and we said we cannot continue to fight these battles to try and stop suburban sprawl developments because we need the housing. So we have to come up with an answer to that. The answer to that from the Sierra Club was to say, let's build tall and dense where we've already built. But given that we have one of the most congested freeways in the nation, how are you going to move people around? If you put another 100,000 pe people in the Leeward Corridor, how are they going to move around? That's what led us to rail. It was a hope at that time. I have to say that Hart has exceeded my wildest expectations on that point. When it comes to development, if you look at the development projects that are slated now on this island, they are all along the rail route. We're talking about something like 48,000 units. And I want to highlight something. Every political leader in this state, from the governor on down, is promising to build 50,000 new housing units on this island in the next 20 years. If it weren't for the rail, where would we be putting them? Kailua, Waimanalo, uh, across from Dole Plantation. Um, the plans are already in place. I mean, if we were, if we were to build those 50,000 units the way we built the last suburban sprawl housing development that we permitted on this island, which is Coa Ridge, which has a density of six houses per acre, to accommodate those 50,000 people, those 50,000 units, we would need 13 square miles of land. Where will we find that land? So I'm astonished at the amount of development that is being put along the rail line. And to me, it's a, a raging success already. There's a, the other issue about the, the costs of running the system. Um, one of the major costs is powering the system, especially because HECO wants to charge us criminal rates for the electricity. They basically want to say, if you use the rail at peak time, we're going to charge you that rate, that peak rate, for all throughout the day, which, as far as I'm concerned, is daylight robbery. So now Hart has set up a, a committee to look at put, installing our own PV system along the guideway. There's enough acreage on the guideway and on the, uh, the, the maintenance center to produce enough solar power to run the system during the daytime. So that would help reduce the costs of running the system. Um, but I have to say, Ridership, traffic, is not my first, second, or even my third reason supporting rail. The second reason for supporting rail, which the Reverend just touched upon, is social and economic equity. I mean, do you know how much it costs to maintain a car in this state? It's $8,000 a year, and 80% of households in this state have two cars. So you're talking about a minimum of about 15 grand a year per household, and that's not even including parking. So if we can allow people with this system to get rid of one car, they're already going to be saving a lot of money. So that's reason number two. Not to mention the, the commutes that people on the west side from Waianae, it averages an hour and 40 minutes one way. Average, so that means when schools are out. It, you know, we all know what it's like in December before Christmas. Those commutes are horrendous. And that is a quality of life issue for the most vulnerable people on this island. And so I don't discount that issue either. Um, and then the third issue, you know, coming from the environmental community, is the resilience it's going to give us. When the hurricane hits, because we know that we're going to be hit by a hurricane, when every utility pole on Dillingham is down, when Nimitz is flooded, cars aren't moving, the rail is still going to be whizzing by. Not only that, because it's 35 foot in the air for the communities that are going to have to start to adapt to rising sea levels, the rail is going to be a, a major piece of resilient in infrastructure that's going to allow us to adapt to sea levels. So that's why I say traffic is issue number four on my list of priorities. I want to follow up on that development question because, or that development point, because you had said in your answer that you're, you're wary of some of the development that is already happening and what is slated to be built. Tell us your concerns. Okay, in Waipahu, where I live, that's the community where rail is already going to come through. It has two transit stops. And in the past two weeks, uh, there are reports of uh, two supermarkets being uh, taken over by development on the rail line. We understand that uh, development will occur on the rail line. But like I said, you need to be very wary and cautious about how you do the development because, for example, the Times Supermarket that's closing in Waipahu 
is part of the Kamehameha Schools development. They're going to put 530 units on 3.8 acres, and they're going to take out Time Supermarket. So that may happen in the next year or so. And at the same time, this past week, we heard that Don Quixote, uh, the other supermarket in Waipau, is going to close next year. So if both supermarkets close next year, then what's going to happen is that it's going to really limit people's access, the, the people in our community, in Waipahu, their access to affordable food and nutritious, fresh fruits and vegetables. And what that may lead to, uh, we've seen that happen on the, on the mainland. They're called food deserts. And I don't think that's what we want on the rail line. But in the next year, we could see that starting to happen. So the question is, what are we going to do to fill that kind of void that's occurring? And if that, uh, the two supermarkets are closing in a year. So the impact is going to happen. And I don't know about social equity, but to me, that's the road to social injustice. Mm -hmm. Tyler, how do, uh, how do we, Councilman, how do we make sure that the development that we do see along the rail line is, is um, keeping all the residents in mind? Yeah, you know, I think that this is something that me and my colleagues are going to have to discuss as more TOD projects come in for permitting is those impacts, not just, you know, over the long term, we always look at the impact on traffic overall and, you know, height and community benefits, but I think we also need to look at um, the sort of displacement questions. You know, we are a big city. And um, projects like this, as well as even smaller ones that we undertake, you know, they do cause growing pains. And so we want to make sure that in a place like Waipahu, especially a working class community like that, that those growing pains aren't all at once very sudden and very, you know, detrimental to the community's health. So um, that's actually a really good point that we should be looking into. I want to bring in Patrick. We've got a bunch of sort of nuts and bolts kind of questions, sure. and I think you're just the man for these. Gary and Manoa wants to know, how would you handle medical emergencies on the rail? We know that these are driverless trains, but there is roving security, um, and Hart did do a number of tests in the lead up to handing this over. But tell us how an, a medical emergency would be handled. Yeah, so there's a couple of things to point out. Uh, we've worked very closely with emergency responders, um, you know, across the island, and they've all received uh, special familiarization training, and we've also done tabletop exercises as well as full-scale exercises to prepare ourselves for just that. Uh, in addition to that, we have a number of plans, procedures, and work instructions that we rely on to govern uh, staff's actions when those actually occur. I'd like to point out, just from a technology standpoint, on board the train, uh, and at all of the stations, we do have emergency telephones and customers are able to essentially, uh, you know, hit that button, talk to a live person um, on the other side, which is in our operations control center. And anytime that button is depressed, uh, essentially the camera pans to that viewpoint. Um, so the person that you're speaking with on the other line can see you um, and, they, and they have a direct connection with emergency responders as well. So I think you know, we're, we're confident that if an emergency um, occurs on the, on the system, that we'll be able to respond uh, rapidly and appropriately for the situation. And there are cameras everywhere, right? Yeah, so whether you're in the station or whether you're on the vehicle, um, we do have 24-7 monitoring of the system through our security command console. And then also um, you know, other positions have access to those cameras as well. Am I mistaken that there's actual ladders on the trains themselves too? Uh, no, you're absolutely correct. So on board the train, in addition to the emergency telephones, you know, we have fire extinguishers. We also have emergency ladders. Uh, the reason those are on the train is because the guideway is elevated. So in the event that a train, uh, if, if there was a train stoppage between stations and we had to evacuate for some reason, we would need to deploy the ladders um, and then safely guide people from you know from that point to a station there's a number of questions about traffic and we do have a graphic that illustrates three of the nine stations that are opening will have uh, free parking and we can bring those up in just a second but there is a question about pearl city which i know larry that you had mentioned as well i want to actually ask this to marcel which is when do they plan to build the parking structure or alternative for the station near pearl highland center we know that that was a major cost cut um, but it is leading to a lot of questions about where these cars are going to go not just for uh, that station but all of the stations 
I think that's still really to be determined. I mean, when, when Hart scaled back the project as part of their latest iteration of the recovery plan, I mean, they're saying technically that, you know, they're working with the feds and they're saying with, with the FTA, <coughs> excuse me, the FTA. And they're saying that this is, this is what we have the capacity to build at this point in time. Um, this covers the 1.55 billion uh, contribution that the federal government is providing. And anything that we uh, build past that, that's a bridge that we are going to cross sometime in, in the future. I, I mean, the you know, and Anthony can weigh in on this, but uh, what you hear a lot too is at some point, might, the city might go back hat in hand to the state legislature. And there's every time they've gone to the le legislature, there's been at least at the start of the session, there's been, you know, a, a, they've, they've urged the, the lawmakers there to extend uh, the GET in perpetuity or extend it longer than what the, the ledge has, has given. Uh, what the ledge has tended to do is just say, we're gonna give you not a penny more than you need. But I think, you know, maybe when the political climate is better, um, you might see a, another bite at the apple, even though state lawmakers have, have said in the past, do not come back to us. Uh, yeah. So it's, I don't know, it's, we'll, we'll see in the coming years. Anthony, let's talk to you about that. Where do you foresee uh, that conversation going? The experience of every major mass transit rail system in the nation has been that one, after it's been inaugurated, people have started to appreciate it and eventually have started to ask for extensions. You lived in Washington, D.C. You know what that experience was like. At first, there was major opposition to the metro, and now people are smacking themselves in the forehead saying, why were we opposed to it, and begging the government to spend more money and build more extensions. I expect to see that here. Um, as a member of the board, I was never going to vote for the Pearl Highlands parking garage. Those were going to be the most expensive parking slots in the entire nation, a third of a billion dollars for 1,600 parking lots. It made absolutely no sense. For, for about double that, you could extend the rail line at grade up Kamehameha Highway to Kauka Boulevard next to Costco, build a car park as large as you like and open up the system to the entire uh, central Oahu and North Shore. As a member of the board, that's what I'll be pushing for. Because I, I do think that those people do need to be served, although the number of people, the number of passengers that were supposed to be coming in as a result of that car park wasn't that much. It was, what, 2% of our ridership? 1,600, I yeah. think. Yeah. Very, very little. In terms of that, uh, you know, if, you, if you're worried about ridership numbers, which, as you know, at the moment I am not, um, I think that's a smarter way to spend your money. Because if you get up to Kauka Boulevard at double the cost of a parking garage, you're almost at Mililani at that point. You open up you know, you could open up to, to Schofield, you can open up a whole, like, whole section of the, of the island. Uh, and I suspect that as people start to use the system and to enjoy it, that there will be pressure for that, that they'll, they'll be saying, hey, let's have an extension up there. We do have that graphic there. You see UH West Oahu has 304 spaces for their parking. Ho'opili has close to 350, Halava 580. Tyler, are you concerned about the stations that don't have parking and what that could happen, what could happen to the neighborhoods there? You know, I think one concern that does come to mind is when we get to the airport, and that's obviously a big attraction for folks, I am concerned about people parking in other neighborhoods then riding the rail, you know, a few stops to the airport and, and leaving their car for a long term. But that's something that I think we can look at and think about over the next few years. As for the Pearl Highlands garage, I do want to commend um, Councilmember Matt Weyer and Councilmember Augie Tulba, who put forward a resolution a few months ago asking for more information and clarity on the timeline and the sort of expectations around this garage eventually. And then um, at our last transportation committee meeting, Councilmember Okimoto asked, um, you know, more information on how we can get a shuttle bus, right, from central Oahu that serves um, either Pearl Highlands or LCC or somewhere. We want people not to drive their car to the rail, but maybe you can get on the bus to begin with and sort of enter this car-free uh, public transit world, you know, from your doorstep instead. The hassle of getting into your car, driving, parking, you know, if we can make it seamless and easy to just get on the bus with your holo card and then get onto rail, that's going to be a lot easier. What you're talking about is a real fundamental shift in the way we do transportation here in Hawaii. I mean, I'm just curious, Stephen, what are your thoughts? Do you think that there will be the kind of buy-in? You say that you might be able to ride this right. from home to work. 
I think, so Larry and I were talking before this, and one of the topics that we were discussing was these drop-off points. These rail stations that don't have parking, uh, they also don't have drop-off points. And so installing those would be a fairly low cost effort, I, I see. So we would have like a, a turnout or something like that where an Uber, Lyft driver could drop off a person, taxis could drop off a person. Uh, there's usually already a bus stop close to that location. Uh, but those kind of locations, we could do those kind of things. And those are fairly low cost, easy solutions to incorporate. Um, going back to the Pearl Highlands, I think Larry's mentioned that the bus routes coming from Milwaukee area to support that would probably be a, a good interim solution to the problem. Uh, a long-term solution would probably have to you know, be something else, but, um, but that's, how I, that's how I see it. I'm lucky enough to have a parking, you know, uh, parking at Halava, uh, so, so I'm not so concerned about it. Uh, but when the actual entertainment district gets put in with the stadium, uh, that 580 slots is going to get filled up pretty quickly. So uh, hopefully we can we can come, you know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, I guess. I want the Reverend to respond. We've gotten a couple of questions here, and this is uh, a sentiment that we've heard. It says here, uh, this is Henry and McCulley, how will people on the windward side benefit from the rail, and will there be tax relief for them? I don't expect you to answer the tax <laughs> relief question, but Tim and Kaneohe also saying, I'm bummed. I had zero input in this rail fiasco, and as a windward resident, I was forced to pay for a system I will never, ever use. Why? You oh. talked about social justice. When we think about how we uh, value this project, how do we get buy-in from the entire island and not just the folks who actually get to board the train? Yeah, I, I certainly think there's some wisdom here um, because for some, this rail may not benefit them, but it'll certainly benefit our children and our children's children and our children's children. And the wisdom of that, I think, is certainly to be reminded to have this long view of what is happening here. Um, too, too, too many times we're, we're, we're too narrow in our view. And by the way, it, it, is, it is clear that there have been, has been miscalculations, misinformation. The trust and the confidence of the public has been deteriorated. And, but yet you also have to acknowledge the, the hard work, the blood, the sweat, the tears of those who have been working hard to get us to this point. Um, but if I'm honest, this is a paradox because on one side, we do celebrate and are excited for this new thing, but yet on the other side, we do lament. We do lament the, the, the failures, the mistakes, the delays. Uh, and, and yet we're kind of in this, uh, theologians from my field would say, a blessed uh, a paradox where it's good work, uh, imperfect work, uh, but yet uh, hard work. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think there just needs to, we need to gain this perspective that, that it goes beyond just being a transportation tool. This isn't, like, like you were saying earlier, this is an infrastructure tool. This is a community building tool. This is a, a, a growth and development tool that we hope will be uh, just and equitable for all people. Can, I, can I, I just say I, yeah. that I think that viewer is being rather selfish. Mm. I mean, <clears throat> Kanioe and Kailua, between them, have eight lanes. They have three sets of tunnels that we all paid, the whole community paid for those folks over there. Folks out in Waianae have two lanes. In Kailua, they have eight lanes, two on the Pali, two on the Lika Lika, two on H3, and one in each direction on Kamehameha. Eight lanes out of their communities. Waianae has two. I think they're being incredibly selfish. And ultimately, the other thing is that this is a generational thing. If you look at the young people, they do not want to live in suburbs. They don't want to drive cars. The, the number of kids between the ages of 18 and 35 who have applied for driver's licenses in the last 15 years has dropped by more than 30%. They don't want to drive cars. So I think that that viewpoint that you're hearing from Kanioe is, is blinkered and selfish. M Mitchell, I want to get your thoughts on that as well. You talked about you riding the train and also your kids riding the train. What kind of an impact do you hope this has for their commute and, and their experience living on Oahu? Well, I echo the last two speakers on the generational thing. It's for our keikis, our grandkids, our great-grandkids. And also, as, as they were talking about, um, I guess the last question came from Kailua. I mean, we live on an island. Um, 
talk, he said about H3, H2, H1, all these infrastructure uh, construction jobs took 20, 20 years to, mm. to fruition. A lot, of a lot of opposed it, but now everybody can't live without it. So it's, it's hard for us to justify and say, we don't want it, but it's for our kikis, for our kids. And, and I just want to, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead, yeah, I was going to just build on that because <clears throat> I, I could definitely appreciate the perspective, you know, you know, if you're on the other side of the island, it feels that way. But when you, when you try to, you know, evaluate that, again, this system is for the next 7,500 years. And when you look around at where people want to live and, you know, you want, you want this quality of life that everyone's talking about, transportation is one element of that. So, you know, if we want to be in a place that has a, a high quality of life, some place that's innovative, sustainable, and has good economic growth, that's good for all of the residents. And in order to, uh, to be that, to thrive that, you need to have a very strong uh, transportation system. And when you, you, know, you look to peers and you look around the world, um, strong transportation systems are multimodal. They reach to everywhere they, they need to. They create access opportunities for all residents to get them to where they need to be. And it's really taking and optimizing each mode of transportation. And, and you know, that's what we're building up to here. I want to bring Kayoni in because you talked about how you, we, you acknowledge at the top in your answer that we need the rail, but also you have the, the viewpoint that you're still opposed to the rail. Uh, I think there, there may be others in our community who feel the same way. Tell us a little bit about that. It's the corruption uh, from the very beginning. You know, the, uh, we have the ORNL, the Oahu, uh, uh, the old railway. There's a 40 foot wide right of way from um, Ko'olina into the city that's open. And, uh, you know, uh, we were begging them at the beginning put the rail on the right of way that's already there. It only has two buildings on the whole thing, it's sitting there wide open. Instead, we've gone down the middle of uh, areas that are terribly expensive. Uh, you know, when we look back at the beginning and the, uh, the Ho'opili uh, connection with the rail, that was all so crooked. Uh, the money that they bought the city council with, one, one member had 43% of her money in her campaign came from Ho'opili and rail donors and she was the least. It went higher and higher and higher, 72% for our uh, representative out in the, our area, 76% for Ron Manor, uh, you know? 92% of the money that Elefante was elected with came from donors of the rail and, and donors of uh, Ho'opili. The whole thing from the very beginning, just, you know, it just reeked. I took that to the, uh, to the Ethics Commission. I went to their meetings for eight months in a row and finally they said, it's not within our realm. <laughs> you know, uh, just crooks all over the place. Well, those individuals aren't here to defend themselves, so I, I do want to okay. do, do wanna give them that, uh, that defense, if you will, or at least acknowledge that they're not here. But I understand that there is a lot of scrutiny on this project. And Marcel, I wanna go back to you on this. Um, there are a lot of people who have similar viewpoints to Keone who feel like they, they're not really ready to embrace this project. What are you hearing from the people that you interview about the public sentiment when it comes to rail? Yeah, I think there's a lot of skepticism uh, just because you, you hear the, you know, comments that, you know, Anthony and everybody are making, which are very valid. Um, but it just seems, if, if I had to sum it up, it, it's the general sense that rail is just always on the horizon. You know, um, when we talk about transit oriented development and all of these plans, um, you know, it was, it was frankly the same thing I was hearing 10 years ago when rail was going to be completed in 2019 for, for service in 2020. And when you consider that now you're looking at a 2031 start date for, uh, to get to the Civic Center, you know, that is, that is a long time and that is families that frankly thought that they were going to have rail in 2020 you know just think hypothetically when small children that are going to be out of the household now when you know so that 
and you know, and the, and the Reverend kind of touched on this. Is we're talking about the promise for future generations, but I think when you know when I talking to people in the community, it's this sense of that promise lost for those who are, you know, in the here and now and trying to get by present day. Um, I, I think that that really touches to some of the erosion of the of the public trust in the project. Well, Anthony, let's talk a little bit about that and look forward to Middle Street uh, opening hopefully by 2025 and then the full system by 2031. Do you think that this project will be on target to actually meet those those goals and those deadlines? So the last two or three contracts we've let have come in under budget. The last contract we let was a half a billion dollars, came in 3% under budget. We have about a billion dollars in our contingency fund. The revenues coming in from GET and TAT are much higher than we anticipated. Personally, this, I, uh, this, I can't say that this is the feeling of the board yet because we haven't really had these conversations, but I actually think that we will have enough money to get to Ala Moana with what we've got coming in now, so long as we can keep the lid on the costs. There's one major shoe left to drop, which is the contract to build the actual guideway in the city center. If that comes in close to budget, then I'm very confident that we will actually, we'll definitely be able to do one more station beyond Civic Center. Personally, I think we have a fairly decent chance of getting to Ala Moana. But you know, this conversation raises a larger point because we like to beat ourselves up here in Hawaii. And quite rightly, I mean, we have a very well-informed electorate and a, a, an astonishing level of activism in this state. It's great. It's one of the things I love about this state. Um, but um, I lost the thread of what I was going to say. Now. <laughs> <laughs> um, the skepticism and the engagement you were saying is what you appreciate. No, that what, I actually don't want to talk about Hawaii because I actually think that this is a national problem. Um, and from my point of view, it's a very serious national problem. As a nation, we have to do a huge amount of construction in the next 30 years if we're going to decarbonize our economy. And if we don't decarbonize our economy, the future looks very grim for us. We have to do, we have to, for example, triple the size of the national grid. The amount of development we have to do, and it has to be done fast. And at the moment, I mean, so look, uh, the Boston, the big dig in Boston, originally uh, estimated at 2.56 billion. What is the cost by the time the people of Massachusetts finish paying off their bonds in the year 2038, much later than Hawaii, $22 billion. The Eastside Access Project in New York, which connects the Long Island Railroad to Grand Central Station, they let the contract in the year 2006 for $2.1 million. It was supposed to be completed in 2011. They opened it a couple of months ago 11.1 billion was the price tag. This is a problem all across the country. Part of the problem is caused by people who I think is belonging to my tribe, you know, upper middle class, educated environmentalists who are opposing development. And it's, I know this sounds perhaps a little melodramatic, but I actually think it's putting the future of our civilization at risk. We need to come up with a way of building these huge developments that we need. I mean, we have to build, we have to, parts of the coastline have to be armored. Not all of it, we, we're gonna be retreating in some places, but some places we're gonna armor. We'll retreat in Kahala, but we'll armor Kaka'ako, for example, here. We can't do that if we're spending these huge, I mean, the, 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 the California high-speed rail, started out at 30 billion, they're at 80 billion now. Well, this none is of those examples problem. give me much faith that we're actually going to get <laughs> well, to. No, one, thing that, <laughs> one thing that I'd like to mention about that is, is I know it's a slightly disappointment that the entire system's not being delivered all at once, uh, but it does give us an opportunity for the last uh, segment because we have learned a lot. You know, there's been a lot learned, not just um, inward facing from an organizational perspective or an owner's perspective, but also from an industry perspective for those who are actually uh, you know, delivering the work. So, so that feeds into the higher level of confidence into the schedule, the better pricing because there's not as much risk priced into the work because everybody has, has learned. So it, it, it is, um, you, know, you can't help but dis be disappointed if the whole project isn't delivered at once. But the one positive note about that is, um, you know, higher levels of confidence with scope, schedule, and budget definitely going into this last segment. I wanna is, is there a way 
though, that we can get from 2025 to sooner when it comes to the airport in Makalapa. Because right now we have to wait until 2025 to actually be able to use the rail to the airport. And we, as we all know, Middle Street's a significantly farther past the airport than, than you know, um, so I don't, I don't understand. Is there a way we can get to the point where we could open that, that P, those two stations earlier than 2025, or do we have to wait till Middle Street is completed? And that's, can you guys answer that question to it for us? I, I, I guess the way that I would answer it is, it, you know, there's always possibilities to do things differently. You know, there may be additional costs associated with that. Um, and I'll just use a brief example. Before you open any system, you know, there has to be a high level of, you know, testing associated with that certification. So you would actually have to undertake that, uh, you know, twice, you know, for, for that same segment. So it doesn't mean that it's impossible, but I can tell you that uh, there's always interest in looking at the schedule, looking at alternatively, you know, alternative ways to deliver that and see if portions of it can be moved forward or not. I don't think anyone's come to the conclusion on like an affirmative conclusion, but I know it's it's I mean, constantly is, being yeah, looked at. This is at. a question I pose to the Hart representative at my mm -hmm. meeting every month: yeah. is how do we get to the airport quicker? But well, one, of, one of the lessons <laughs> learned mm -hmm. has been that at Hart at the beginning overpromised and underdelivered, mm -hmm. and these days the management is doing the opposite. And I think they're smart to do that. They're not promising. They're not overpromising. They're not promising anything. They're working hard. They're working very well. At first, Hart was a mess. It Let's was a complete mess. Now it is working well. These guys are working well. The board is working well. I want to bring in a question here, and, and this goes to actually to you, Patrick. Uh, and, and, I, and I've heard this as well. Uh, I'm concerned that the homeless will use the rail as daycare centers. They're being cooled, nice and clean. Uh, since there's no attendant, how is, there going to be, how is this going to be avoided? What are your concerns about people staying on the train perhaps a little bit too long? Sure. Well, I'll mention some things that everybody may not be aware of. So even though our trains are unattended, driverless, uh, we do have staff out there on the system. So at every station, you will encounter a station operator. Uh, even though the trains are driverless, we do have positions that are called train operators. They, you will see them on board every other train. And of course, primarily, they're there to offer uh, customer information, customer service, and then uh, troubleshoot any faults that there may be on the system. Uh, in addition to that, we have what we refer to as level two security. Um, you know, we have them at various locations throughout the system, and they are, as, you know, they enforce our code of conduct, right? So um, the, the rail system in general is what we would call kind of a closed system. You need uh, fare to get in, uh, and you need fare to get, you know, basically to get, tap in and tap out of the system. And you have to have a destination, right? So the, the way the system is designed and the code of conduct uh, it's not intended for anyone to uh, simply be in the system or about the system without a destination. As the construction moves closer to town, we all are experiencing the disruptions along Dillingham. I, I want to hear from Larry for a moment just about what the impacts of traffic were and, and the construction itself were like for your community and if you've recovered since then. It, it, was, a major <clears throat> it was a major impact, especially to the smaller businesses. Um, <laughs> And it just so happened this last Tuesday, because we thought about during the pandemic, uh, we recognized Giataku and also Paisanos for staying open during that time, while a lot of the other businesses had to close down. It was the pandemic and the rail that impacted both of them. But uh, uh, I, I really see uh, down the road we can get this fixed when, when we, uh, we still have to put focus on it. You know, like Steve said a while ago, uh, you know, we need these U-turns put back into place because those small businesses are hurting. Uh, but uh, we're, my ears are wide open from our board to make sure that when they've got problems and stuff, we get that over to heart. And we do have heart at every one of our board meetings. They've been, they've been very positive, keeping us updated. And uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, you know, the city bought the banana patch area where the garage was supposed to be. The longer we wait uh, for, the, for a parking garage to go up, there will be ideas to put uh, high-rise buildings in those areas. The city's already purchased it. Those families had to move out and it's vacant now. So I'm really thinking that uh, we might lose that opportunity and have to result to something else. 
Tyler, I want to bring you in just about the Dillingham traffic. Not being able to take a left turn for four years, this certainly feels like a long time. What are you hearing from folks? I know that's not necessarily your district, but what are you hearing from yeah. the business? Well, I, I share Dillingham with Councilmember Cordero, and the businesses have been very vocal about their concerns. Um, right now, you know, we're doing the utility work there. That's disruptive. When the column starts going, that's going to be an even bigger challenge. Tomorrow, actually, um, I'm introducing a bill that's going to be putting, uh, asking the department to put on some rules around how they use a transit mitigation fund. We learned our lesson, I hope we learned our lesson, from Waipahu and IAEA and how those businesses suffered. I don't want to see the businesses in Dillingham have to suffer. We need to learn our lessons. Same with some of the, you know, the procurement issues that, that led us to the delays and other things. We need to learn our lessons as we come into town where things get a lot more complicated. So we're going to be putting forward that bill and I'm going to continue, you know, pushing for some sort of mechanism where we can help these businesses survive construction and then afterwards thrive, hopefully, with new ridership, with, you know, new patrons coming in from the west side into town. But we need to learn those lessons and apply them. Yeah, Richard, let's hear from you on that about what that experience was like for your community and, and what you would hope would be different for folks down the line. No, I think uh, any community where rail is going to go through, they'll experience the same problems in terms of the congestion and the disruption that it uh, uh, it has on all of the, uh, the community and the businesses along the, the rail route. So the best thing I can say about rail coming through a community is that it's temporary. So the quicker they can get in and out, the better. So as long as heart keeps the pressure on to keep moving without delay, then that's the best we can do at this point. One thing I would add to the question about what rail is going to do for others on, on the island. One of the things we often forget is the reason we started rail is because of the complaints about congestion on the roadways, on the freeway, it was maxed out, it still is, not getting any better. The reason that's happened is because it's by state and city policy has directed all of the growth to the west side, in Waipahu, in Kunia, in Eva, Bakakilo, Kapolei, and central Oahu, Mililani Coal Ridge, for example. There are all the developments on the west side, so the only relief or alternative to the problem that uh, we were having with transportation was rail. It may not solve all the problems, and I'm sure it won't. It doesn't look that way now because it's unfinished and we're still going to wait for a long time. So if we remember that, and as the other uh, speaker said from Hart, you know, the Windward side has three tunnels that people can travel on. The other thing is that there has been no development in those areas in East Honolulu, in, on the Windward side, in the North Shore area. And a lot of times we hear the saying, people say, keep the country country. But then you got to ask, for who? Our kids cannot so <laughs> afford a home on the North Shore or in the, on the Windward side. I mean, they're much higher than what you pay on the West side because those are all the newer developments. And now, with all of this affordable housing that we expect to see on the rail line, where do you think all of the new developments are going to happen? In the same communities where we've had all of the development, the West side, Pearl City, and Kalihi. It's going to transform all of those communities along the rail route in those areas. Well, Tyler, let, let's talk about that. Are we asking certain communities to bear too much of a burden here? Well, I think we already have. I mean, we, we as Richard said, we directed all of this growth out to the west side. As Keone mentioned, 76,000 cars potentially, and yet we did not provide until now that alternative. And so as we think forward, as we you know, get the rail into town, as TOD projects start coming up, I mean, this is part of the conversation. And, it's, and rail is not the end all and be all of it. We have to also talk about the bus routes, right, that get people to there, that make it easy for people to access this so they don't need to rely on cars. This is a much bigger conversation. It's not one that you know, we're going to solve overnight. But 10 years from now, 20 years from now, Honolulu is much better off with rail than we would be without it. And, and I say that as somebody that uses public transportation. Um, not all the time. I still have a car. I drive it around. I drove it here to the studio. But earlier today, to go get lunch, hopped on the bus. It's so much easier than taking my car, unparking, 
reparking somewhere else to pick something up. Much easier. Keone, what's going to change your mind on that on that whole equation that that Honolulu is better off with the rail than without it? Are you at that point yet? Oh, I've passed that point. I, I, I do think that we're better off with the rail. And uh, like I said at the beginning, I really strongly support people riding the rail because we need that. You know, we're we're desperate for it, and uh, and getting more desperate. I think that uh, my, my feeling, though, is personally, I. I um, you know, you are what the company you keep is. And if you smother yourself with people that are corrupt, you, uh, you kind of bring that on yourself. And I, I just, uh, I, I admire uh, Anthony uh, Alto, you know, and uh, he's done so much in life and now he's on heart and fighting for us. And I do think there are good people on heart. But I just, I, I don't want personally to be uh, connected with all of the corruption that I've seen because it is just too, 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 too much. Patrick, I want to bring in some questions, and these are, again, nuts and bolts from folks. And I think a lot of this will be answered once people actually start to ride, but let's get a few of these in. What's the top speed of rail? How do we get a bicycle from the street level up to the, up to the train itself? Not all stations seem accessible. And is there elevator access from the walkway to rail entry and enough time to allow people uh, to settle into their seats? For example, a person on crutches or using a walker. So let's start with speed, bikes, and uh, the, the lag time between when you and when you can actually take a seat. Yeah, so uh, our top speed or maximum authorized speed is 55 miles an hour. Uh, we do, uh, we certainly allow for bikes and encourage folks to bring their bikes on board. Uh, there are elevators at every station. We also have uh, tread guides on our stairwells so that if you wanted to walk your bike up the stairs, uh, you can, which is popular in a lot of uh, cities and uh, a lot of bikers choose to, to use those. Um, and then as far as how do you store those on the train, we do have uh, two uh, bike sets in the middle of, uh, in the two middle cars on every train. So you're, it's really easy to use. You basically just, you know, uh, pull the front wheel up, you clip it on and it stays um, secure in that area. You also have the option if you so choose to just, you know, stand and uh, have the bike in your possession and hold on to one of the stanchions or the straps, so it's really kind of up to you. Do you let's, hold on, oh, sorry. Please, so let's set expectations here. Uh, there's one elevator, there's one escalator, and the rest is stairs. And the stairs are really steep. Um, yeah, they're fairly steep, actually. So, so if a person's using a bike, they're going to have to use the elevator, honestly. I can't imagine taking a bike up those stairs. I, I just can't see somebody actually doing that. Um, uh, and that leads also to the topic about facilities, right? There's, at least at the Halava station, there was a bathroom. There, are, I don't know if any other stations have bathrooms or not. Uh, I did view the bathroom at the Halava station. It's, you know, it's got metal fixtures in there. It's got a changing table, even though I was told it was only for employees. So I can't imagine an employee actually changing, using a changing table, a child's changing table. Um, they badge in. And what I was told was, was if there's an emergency, for somebody who has to use the bathroom, they get a hold of an employee and they'll badge them in. If we're expecting 8,000 people to ride this daily, that's a lot of people asking an employee to open up a restroom for them. Um, so I think there needs to be a solution to that at some form. Either some stations have bathrooms, some don't, or you badge in with a, your card to be able to access that you know, bathroom. But there has to be a solution to that because I just don't see the employees doing well, it. Well, Patrick, let's hear from you about the bathroom situation. I know that, you know, the vast majority, as far, as far as I know, of public transit systems, you know, throughout our country don't necessarily have restrooms. Bus stops don't have bathrooms. And this question was asked and answered several years ago, but it's really come up in the last few weeks. So, so what are you hearing? And, and could there be some adaptations to allow for some restrooms? Sure. The, the, before I get to that, I do want to address the bike uh, the bike element. So we do, some of the stations do have two elevators and the good thing is that our elevators are quite oversized. So even if you are bringing a bike into the elevator, you should be quite comfortable and actually be able to accommodate, uh, you know, additional passengers in there with you and, and your bicycle. 
And I, I do agree, everyone may not use the uh, stair treads to get their bike up there because, you know, there are a lot of stairs, but, I, you know, even just the other day, um, seeing, you know, witness someone do that firsthand. So it is an option for those who want to do that and get that extra, you know, that extra exercise. Uh, as far as the bathroom goes, uh, you know, it would be no different than some of the restaurants that you go to today. Um, you know, uh, the uh, design for the system has always been secured access, which was what was described before. And um, you're v absolutely right. Uh, a lot of uh, transit systems do not have, you know, do not have bathrooms. You know, we, we definitely value our customers. If there is an uh, urgent situation, as I mentioned earlier, we do have station operators at all stations. You know, uh, please follow up and you know speak to them about you know getting access to the restroom but more importantly we want it to be safe um, you know we we want a safe system that's why the system is uh, designed the way it is with controlled access I think uh, many of us have seen on the news or heard about recent destructive acts that happened uh, in bathrooms that were not uh, controlled access so um, I guess that's the only thing that I would leave everybody with is if there's an urgent situation, you know, please find an employee and speak to them and we'll be glad to help you out. At the same time, we wanna make sure that the system stays safe and, and we don't have anything that's not supposed to happen uh, in, in, in a bathroom happen. Besides which, what do people do today? If they're riding the, the express bus, bus from Capelet, there's no restroom on the bus. Yeah. I'm not sure quite why this has suddenly become yeah. such, a, such a key issue amongst people. I mean, it's a fairly short ride, I don't see I don't, I don't think we're predicting hordes of people arriving at the station and needing to use the bathroom. Yeah, and I would say even the travel time between stations is, you know, on average two to three minutes. So really this is the type of system where you get in and get out and, you know, you get to your, you know, we talked earlier about it being, you know, just over 22 minutes from East Capilé to Loja Stadium. Uh, you know, I think the majority of folks are, are not going to be on the system long enough uh, to, you know, to use the restrooms. Keone, I know you wanted to weigh in on this. <laughs> I just think it's a joke. I, I, I think it's criminal. I, I, I think building a, a, a rail system without bathrooms for people to use is just criminal. You know, this is a kind of corrupt thinking that, uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm so It's nothing to do with corruption. It is. I mean, you know, the, the idea, the people of Hawaii need to be treated like people. You know, uh, the, our Safeway in Kapole has a bathroom. It's one of the few that's really open. There's no problem with that bathroom. You know, I, um, sure, there's somebody killed somewhere in the United States once a month or something like that. You know, but uh, for crying out loud, we ought to have public bathrooms. People are going to be making going to the bathroom on the trains, on the, on the, on the walkways, on the stairways. It, it, we're, we're just asking for it. You know, let's, let's get wise and start doing things normal. We've got about 15 minutes left, so I want to uh, shift the conversation if I could. And Anthony, you know, you talked about perhaps having uh, a spur go to Mililani or, or close to it. Uh, there are conversations about the rail, of course, going as far as UH and, and maybe even beyond. When do you think this project will actually be finished? Will there ever be a day that we're not working on extending rail? Well, once we've got to Hawaii Kai, uh, Waianae, uh, Mililani, I'm not sure about Haleiwa. Um, I've even heard people talking about punching yet another tunnel through the, the Ko'olau <laughs> to get to Kailua. <laughs> it's quite possible that the system could continue to expand for decades. Obviously, it's, part of it's got to do with money. Can we afford it? Um, Personally, I think this investment is vital. People tend to forget how much of our budgets go on transportation. It is the third most significant item in the budget of people who live in Hawaii. We spend way too much on housing, 42% of our income on housing, 15% on food, 14% on transportation. Transportation, we spend as much on transportation as we do on healthcare, education, clothing and entertainment combined. The city and the state between them spend more than a third of a billion dollars every year on roads. Um, if we hadn't built the rail line, we were already looking at having to put an extra lane on H1 and possibly on H2. Uh, 
the cost of that would have been billions. So people seem to talk about doing heart, or if we hadn't done heart, think of all the things we could have done with that money. Well, what we would have done is we would have spent that money on transportation in some other way without producing all of these incredible benefits of changing our development. <coughs> so, you know, no, I, I don't buy it. Well, Marcel, that means you're going to have a job forever. You've been reporting on rail for a decade, and it could be decades. Great news to hear. <laughs> decades and decades more. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think there is an end date to this project? Yeah, I, you know, uh, to, to Anthony's point, I, I hear that all the time, too. Think of all that we could have spent. And, you know, I, I, I totally understand. I think it's a valid point. I think the concern, though, is always the cost escalation. You know, it's not so much... Think of what we could have, you know, it's the, the extra five billion, you know, the, the, the project at this point is, is, you know, more than 100% over the original budget from 2012. So it's really, think of the money that, you know, we could be spending on it. I, you know, I'm covering more environmental issues. And uh, just this week you had uh, the Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, in, and they were, they were celebrating $15 million to help uh, protect native forest birds. And I immediately thought to heart, you know, that is, it, it becomes monopoly money almost to a certain extent when you cover this project for so long and you see the, the, co the, the um, change orders and, and things like that. So, I, you know, I, I think Anthony's making some, some sound points about, you know, this is a real investment that has, uh, you know, uh, domino effects and, and positive benefits. But the, the, I guess the concern is, as somebody who's followed this is, is the cost increases, the, you know, the, the original budget versus the, the many billions more that we ultimately wind up to. And you know, if, if, if you can avoid that you know, and kind of promises kept, promises delivered, that might be a different situation. But we have just finished building the most, or we haven't finished building, but by the time we get to Kakaako and hopefully Ala Moana, we will have completed the most difficult, complicated, expensive part of the system to not add on to it after that. I mean, for example, when I mentioned Kauka Boulevard, I'm, I'm suggesting we do it at grade along Kamehameha Highway at a third of the cost that it's costing us to build 35 feet up in the air. I think that's doable. And, um, you know, the one concern that I hear from people at the idea of continuing to use GET funds to, to pay for this is that GET is a regressive tax, which it absolutely is. If the GET surcharge is ever extended to continue expanding the rail system, I can tell you I'll be out there advocating that we take the first 10, 15% of all the revenue we receive through the GET and redistribute it back to the poorest people in the state, the Alice people, who the system is being built for in the first place. So there are ways that we can deal with the it, the, the fact that it's a regressive tax. Larry, I want to bring you in. I mean, what, what are your thoughts about having those kinds of extensions that would definitely impact I, I where you I am definitely live? supportive of ad grade. And, we, and, you know, and when I make my trips up to Costco, you know, and I look at the traffic situation, I really think that right now H2 could manage, you know, if you brought it up through the center of uh, both directions of it, the H2, you could bring that up to Milani. Uh, but, uh, but, I, but I agree, uh, I think that the cost is much less. And I just, one other thing I wanted to mention that years back I had mentioned, you know, when, in the very beginning when we were looking at where the most expensive part of the, of the cost was gonna be for rail, and we knew it was gonna be down Dillingham. And I kept bringing it up to all the officials, why aren't we going deep? Every other major city has tunnels. And I've traveled all over Asia for the last 53 years. The best transportation systems I saw was in Tokyo, Australia, and most importantly, Singapore. Singapore is the same size as Oahu. They have 10 million people. They have a fully integrated transportation system with taxis, with buses, and their rail is all underground. And when people say, well, you can't go down the deep, you're gonna screw up the water table. No, you take a look at, look at how Tokyo built the Aqua Line. They have five miles underneath Tokyo Bay. So I think we could have saved a lot of money if we went deep. And then the other thing is, the face of Pearl City changed forever. You know, I got this monstrosity now running down Cam Highway. And the other thing I brought up to officials, why didn't we build it on a bike path? Because then we would have had a service road, which could have been used for the historic trail the whole time. And, uh, it, and that was a lot of money going down Cam Highway. Tyler, anyway, I want to get your thoughts. thoughts on this. 
Well, I, I think we live in a world where we're constrained. We're constrained by our agreement with the federal government. The state's uh, arrangement with the GET and TAT expires at some point. So I think the focus needs to be, and it needs to be a laser focus on delivering the next phase to Middle Street by 2025, getting the contract out for the uh, columns and a guideway in city center, getting that, <clears throat> nailing that 2031 timeline. I don't wanna see that go any further. I think planning to go to UH Manoa is good, but we need to be focused on this, and this needs to be a top priority. I mean, not, maybe not 100%, but 99% of the effort needs to be on getting this right in the next phase, because if we don't, you know, we're gonna be facing the same kind of clouds and criticism that we've heard for years. We have this chance now to have a reset with an open system, with something that's gonna be delivered in 2025 to Middle Street. Um, the construction's basically done, so it's just testing and getting that going but we need to make sure that we get into town right, and then we can talk about extensions elsewhere. What about some of the adaptations, what Larry was talking about, bringing back more U-turns? You know, we have this system in place. How much flexibility do we have with what is already built? Yeah, so again, this is a part of the, the nature of the beast in working with, you know, county level government, heart, state, federal. It's a question of funding as well. You know, what's the funding priority here? Where does that money come from? to the viewers on the windward side, you know, are we willing to cough up another million or $2 million to put in U-turns to help people, you know, there? It certainly helps the businesses, you know, which is great, but we have to kind of weigh that among all of the other things that we need to do. So it's a tough question. Um, and I, I think as we go along with the system that's operational, people are, are using it, people are using the bus to get there, we can kind of weigh these changes. Um, and certainly if I'm still the transportation committee chair, we can start looking at these things. Um, we already did with the um, crossing at Pearl Highlands, right? There's community outcry and we said, hey, we, we need to get this done before we open. So, you know, there is room, I think, for adaptation. Um, but again, it's within all the constraints that we face, working with multi, you know, jurisdictional partners. Um, but we do want to make a system that works as well as it can for as many people as, as we can. You know, Mitchell, when you get on that train with your children, what are you going to be thinking about and, and what do you want their experience to be? Well. <clears throat> my children range from 26, 22, <laughs> going to be 18, they graduated and going to, going to go to UH, um, West Oahu, and now I have a one-year-old. So it's a variety. Quite of a reasons. range. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's a, you know, the rail or Skyline is the one of the largest uh, construction projects or the largest construction project in, in this Hawaii's history, Oahu's history. And to see this where they can be able to use it, be able to go from either UH West Oahu, HCC, LCC, all the way to UH um, Manoa. If that was possible, you know, in, in hopefully in my lifetime to see that go through fruition, yeah. I would be happy and, and I think they would benefit from it. Yeah, Richard, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I tend to agree with what was, has been said about the extensions, that um, we've got to get to Middle Street first, then through Dillingham and get into town and to the Civic Center. That's the, the next phase, and we have to do that. Then we can uh, already start the conversation about going to Ala Moana, and that will be the complete line. But then the full value of the rail is if it goes to UH Manoa and to Waikiki. After that, then we can talk about other extensions. And every rail line that you have in the U.S. always works that way. They build the, the spine first and it branches out after that. So I don't think there will be any difference here. It's just a matter of how long the wait. And I think part of the issue is this is a phenomenon that we see all the time here in Hawaii. We do a plan and then it sits on a shelf. And then we do another plan to update that one, and that also sits on the shelf. I'm much more interested in having a plan that we can stick to, we can get it done, it's practical. And so that's why you know, I think it's so important that we, again, get to Middle Street, get into town before we, we start to kind of explore in any great detail um, going beyond into other areas.
Yeah, Anthony, you know, we're almost out of time, but I, I do want to get, you know, you, you were talking about how um, in Washington, D.C., for instance, or in other communities, that once people experience this, the perception changes. What do you think it's going to take to flip that switch? Because there still is quite a bit of resistance to this project, even though it is here now. Uh, there are even people who would like to tear those guideways down. So when, what, what will it take to flip that? Time. I think people will start to use it as it expands, as it gets to Ala Moana and hopefully beyond. I mean, we already have a committee at heart looking at extensions because it's taken us a long time to build up this core team of expertise within Heart. They're really working well now. It's taken a long time to get here. I wasn't on the board back then, so I don't have to apologize for that. It's working really well now. So now's the time to start thinking about how we can add on the extensions because the lead time to do these things is so long if we don't start now, we'll get to Ala Moana, we'll lose all of these people, and then we'll be starting from scratch again. So I think, uh, you know, I disagree with, with Tyler. I think now is the time to start thinking about this, and especially because the, one of the options that we want to look at is if we can do a P3 to get through to UH. The P3 that was explored before, I never understood how it was supposed to work because there was no new development potential to be captured by our P3 partner. All of the development potential down in Kaka'ako is already taken by Howard Hughes and Kamehameha Schools. I don't know how we thought a private developer could get money out of it. But to get to UH, we could do that with a private developer. We're looking at that now. So there may be a way to actually build onto the system without putting our hands in taxpayers' pockets, which would make me very happy. Um, and uh, and I think a lot of taxpayers, too. Reverend, I want to give you the last word tonight. We've got just under two minutes left. You know, I want to go back to that sentiment that we heard from the folks on the Windward side. And it's not just folks on the Windward side. Uh, there are a lot of folks who say, yeah, I might live downtown. I might live right along the rail route, but I'm never going to ride this. Uh, why is this still a worthy investment for our community? Yeah, I, I would start by telling everyone, just take a deep breath in and be okay with sitting in that paradox that I mentioned earlier. Um, that there is things to lament and things that would be moving forward to lament as well. But at the same time, there'll be things to celebrate and things that will be meaningful and powerful. And mobility is one of these things that is so helpful to the people who will use this rail. But we move forward with hope, with faith that it's all going to work out. Okay, we'll leave it there. This is an issue, of course, that has been contentious since its inception. We don't expect to change that, and certainly not in one discussion. But Skyline starting tomorrow is a significant turning point. We'll know much more about the true impact on traffic and public perception of this project once people can actually ride the rail. Mahalo to all of our guests, and to those of you at home for being part of tonight's town hall. We are taking a break next month, but we will be back for another Kako in August, focusing on disaster preparedness. We now have El Nino conditions in the Pacific, which means warmer water and potentially much stronger storms. So are we ready? We do hope you join us then. I'm Yanji Denise. Until next time, aloha.